Okay, we're ready to start the 2021 preliminary rate information meeting. I'll pass things over to Gore Dobloroski, our chair, to get things started. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for taking the time to join us virtually today. My name is Gore Dobrowski, and I'm the chair of the Saskatchewan Workers' Compensation Board. On behalf of the WCB, I want to welcome you to our preliminary rate information meeting. I'd also like to welcome you on behalf of your board members, employer rep Larry Flowers and worker rep Gary Hamblin. It is indeed my privilege to address you this morning. This is a unique year for the meeting and the COVID-19 pandemic has created some challenges in us hosting annual public meetings. We remain committed to the health and safety of our staff, our customers, and our partners. Because of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, and to maintain physical distancing, we are required to host our preliminary rate information meeting by teleconference. And as a safety precaution, wherever you are today, we urge you to follow Saskatchewan government guidelines on self-monitoring and self-isolation to protect yourself and your family. If you've been to a previous preliminary rate information meeting, you already know that we have a lot of information to cover in the next hour. We'll have 30 minutes after the presentation for your questions, so please take notes and write down your questions as we proceed. The question period is open to everyone attending. When our CEO has wrapped up his final comments, you can submit your questions through the chat function, which should be on the right-hand side of your screen. Our moderator will read your questions, and please be sure to cite your name. We will try to get to all of your questions on the call today. If not, we will add responses and post the Q&A to our website. After today's meeting, the preliminary industry rate code specific sheets will be available on the WCB's website. Each sheet contains specific rate code statistics and the 2021 preliminary premium rate. This annual meeting is part of our rate setting process so we can remain accountable to you. This is also why we want your feedback on the proposed rates. We really appreciate the time you've taken to be here and be part of this meeting. Our vision at the WCB is to eliminate injuries and restore abilities. That's the foundation of all the work we do at the WCB. There are things we all must do to achieve this. As employers, you need to provide a safe workplace for your employees. We believe the best employers have effective safety management systems in place to protect their workers. If anyone cuts corners to save time, this could cost a life. Even small actions can have devastating consequences. To illustrate the commitment we hope all business owners share, the familiar phrase, on time and on budget, should be expanded to say, on time, on budget, with no injuries. We believe that by adding those three little words, we're now covering every measure of success, including the health and safety of the people working on those projects. At the WCB, we strive to balance the needs of workers and employers. To achieve our vision, our mission is to be a customer-centric organization that continuously seeks to add value for our customers through a culture of continuous process improvement. This means we are continuously improving our practices to deliver the best customer service possible. Toward that goal, later this year, we are moving to a paperless system of the 2021 rates. You will be able to log into your secure WCB online account to view your 2021 premium rate statement, experience rating letter, and certificate if eligible. We will not be sending any physical mail. By moving this information online, you get the information quicker and it helps protect your privacy. Less printed paper helps contribute to reducing the spread of COVID-19. Environmentally, 
This is a more sustainable approach to significantly reduce the amount of paper printed and mailed. If you don't have a secure WCB online account, you can sign up for one at www.wcbsask.com. We're also taking steps to make sure our rate setting meeting more valuable for you, our customers. Today's information will be available online after the meeting. This is all part of our efforts to constantly advance our service to you. By the way, you can find a recorded copy of all of our public sessions on our YouTube channel. Just search for Saskatchewan Workers' Compensation Board. As a board, it is our legislative obligation to guarantee the future of our compensation system. That means we need to be good financial stewards, even in the midst of this pandemic. As we all know, this is a year of extraordinary circumstances in Saskatchewan. No doubt many workers and employers are feeling the impact associated with COVID-19, including business closures and unfortunately, job losses. Canadians across the country are experiencing additional pressure, both at home and on the job, as our world continues to change and adjust to this pandemic. There is a lot of uncertainty as to what the future holds or how long the pandemic will continue. Under our rate model and taking into account claims costs and payroll, we calculated what the average preliminary rate would have been for 2021. We calculated the rate to increase to $1.23. However, to help mitigate the impact the pandemic has had on our economy, we as a board made the decision not to pass these increases to employers. For 2021, we will hold the preliminary average premium rate at $1.17. This is exactly the same as the 2020 average rate. Now for the third year in a row, the WCB's 2021 proposed average employer premium rate will remain at $1.17. Decreases in reported payroll compound by increasing claim costs result and the average industry premium rate of $1.23. But again, we've made the decision to hold at the board level and hold at $1.17 for 2021. This slide shows the average premium rate history. Holding at board level this year means that everyone realizes some of the benefits of this decision. Some other compensation boards in Canada have also released their 2021 preliminary average premium rates. Those that haven't will likely do so in the next few weeks. As you can see from the slide, BC is proposing to keep their rate steady at $1.55. Quebec is proposing to decrease their rate by eight cents to $1.77. Nova Scotia is proposing to keep their rate steady at $2.65. And Ontario is proposing to keep their rate steady at $1.37. With the hold across the board, we expect our rate to be the third lowest in the country. However, it may surprise you to know that our goal as a board is not to have the lowest rate in Canada. Our goal is to uphold a balance between stable rates and a fully funded compensation system. Employers can influence their industry and individual premium rates through effective injury prevention and return to work programs. Industry premium rates are also affected by the degree to which employers in an industry work to eliminate workplace injuries. After all, the least expensive injury is an injury that never happens. Individually, Employers who commit to eliminate injuries in their workplace benefit from lower premium rates through the Experience Rating Program. In 2019, for the fourth year in a row, 88% of employers in Saskatchewan recorded zero injuries and zero fatalities in their workplaces. 
This is a huge success and a testament to the safety efforts being done in our province. So thank you for all of your health and safety efforts. However, even with these advances, the average premium rate for 2021 would have increased if it weren't for the pandemic. This indicates there is still more work to be done, and so we must all remain vigilant. The purpose of this slide is to help employers understand why you pay premiums. The workers' compensation system in Canada as we know it has been established through something known as the Meredith Principles. These principles were adopted over 100 years ago, and I believe they are still as valid today as they ever were. Reflecting something known as the historic compromise, the Meredith Principles provide for an employer-funded compensation system in exchange for which the workers give up their right to sue. The principles stipulate that the WCB will provide no-fault mandatory insurance coverage to protect workers from workplace injuries by providing benefits such as wage loss and medical. Through this no-fault system, employers are protected from legal action arising from workplace injury and collectively fund the compensation system. We remain committed to the merit of principles that protect families, employers, and entire communities. All of us here representing the Saskatchewan WCB are extraordinarily proud to be able to help injured workers, their families, and employers when they are negatively affected by a workplace injury. So with that, I'd like to now turn it over to our CEO, Phil Germain, to discuss the evolving economic conditions and funding future costs. Again, thank you for attending today. As well, I hope you've managed to stay healthy and well during the pandemic. As most of you know, WCB has a legal obligation to be fully funded so that we can meet all of our obligations to employers and injured workers. There are four key drivers or issues, our funding and future costs, of, uh, uh, that impact our funding and future costs that we're watching closely and managing. The first is the positive trend in claims experience, as we've talked about for the last couple of years, is flattening out and in some cases, it's reversing. As you can see from Gord's comments, this is putting upward pressure on premium rates. We signaled this last year during rate setting, and many rate codes and employers can reasonably expect rate increases in the future as early as 2022 if performance doesn't change. One of those factors is healthcare costs continue to increase at a rate higher than inflation. Now, having said that, there is, uh, there is research to strongly suggest that investing in healthcare early can lead to better outcomes overall, including quicker recovery and return to work. A good example of this are psychological injuries. Psychological claims costs do continue to increase, and there is increased frequency of psychological claims and corresponding durations. However, this could be a result of the fact that society is getting more comfortable with reporting because there's less stigma around talking about psychological injuries. A large portion of these claims come from industries with higher averages, uh, higher average salaries. These points help explain the increasing compensation trends to some extent that we're seeing and the increasing medical aid trends that we're seeing. There are also fee schedules in some place, uh, fee schedules in place with general inflation uh, increases that contribute to those increases as well. So really in summary, there are more claims that are accessing uh, improved healthcare services and those healthcare services are increasing over time. Overall, the long, the long term trend in claims experience like I said, it's flattened out, 
and it's no longer offsetting the increasing costs in health care and the average weekly wage. The second major factor that we're paying attention to is projecting payroll. Projecting payroll and costs for 2021 was challenging. We are expecting to see an increase of payroll of about 4% from 2020 to 2021. Due to the negative impacts of COVID-19, there are major decreases in payroll for some industries, while others showed more typical increases. We have decided to use pre-pandemic experience to predict the post-pandemic payroll and costs. We're seeing at this point, unless future experience tells us otherwise, that the pandemic situation that we saw in March, April, May, June, July, August, September is so far a temporary uh, adjustment. We'll pay attention to that and see how that trend continues. The maximum, access, maximum accessible wage for 2021 will be $91,100, which is a 2.5% increase from the 2020 maximum accessible wage of $88,906. The third factor is related to investments and the overall economy. And it's not clear to, to us how long the pandemic will continue or what permanent effect it will have on employment or claims experience into 2021 and beyond. Due to the uncertainty, these costs will not be passed on to employers at this time. Ongoing investment losses, ongoing high, higher number of serious injuries and fatalities that are typically high cost and increasing healthcare costs could put insurmountable pressure on premium rates in the short to medium term. And the fourth major factor is our funded ratio. The board is financially sound to absorb the cost increases in the short term, but cannot continue this practice going forward. As stated in the 2016 rate, review, rate model review, premiums collected in the future must be sufficient to cover expected costs and expenses. Given the changing economic environment, WCB's external actuary, Aon, has recommended a financial sustainability study. The scope of this actuarial study will be comprehensive and will commence in early 2021. We are currently anticipating increased premium rates in 2022 at this time. So why did we decide to go with $1.17 versus $1.23? The required rate according to the rate model and without a board level hold on premium rate is $1.23. Later in the presentation, we will discuss the reasons for increases related to administration and healthcare components of the premium rate. The six cent artificial reduction in the premium rate amounts to $13.4 million subsidization of the premiums. While this will result in a drop in our funding ratio, we believe it's the right thing to do under the circumstances. Keeping the rate at $1.17 means that WCB will be collecting $13.4 million less in premiums in 2021, which will result in a loss in 2021 of an additional $13.4 million. The premiums collected are not expected to cover estimated costs for 2021 and therefore will ultimately mean that the injury fund will be reduced. This reduction to the injury fund would, will, would still keep our funded ratio above the minimum target of 105% as defined by our policy. <clears throat> While we were at 119% funded in early 2020, based on our current data, the funding ratio will approximately be 110% in 2021. This does not factor in the possibility of another major market downturn. The board recognizes the difficult economic situation 
2020 has brought, and the rate hold is a short-term measure in place for the benefit of all employers. The board is financially sound to absorb the cost increases in the short term, but as I said, we cannot continue this practice or it may push us into an unfunded position, which could cause premium rate increases for several years, as we've seen in other jurisdictions. I'll now turn it over to Crystal Nett, our Chief Financial Officer and Vice President of Corporate Services, to walk us through our disciplined approach to rate setting, which includes balancing key principles. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Phil. As you can see on this slide in a moment, we look at the balancing principles needed within our rate model. The premium rate setting process should appropriately balance these sometimes competing principles. It should provide for the security of benefits, be robust and sustainable, as well as satisfy the needs, goals, and expectations of employers, while being actuarially sound, relatively simple, and easy to understand, communicate, and administer. Fairness needs to be balanced with collective liability, however, and as you can see, these are the first two principles. Fairness is about accountability, equity, and incentives for prevention. Premiums paid by current employers should cover the costs of their injured workers during the premium period. This principle covers intergenerational equity, in other words, Current employers should not be paying for claims costs generated by past employers, nor should they be subsidizing the claims costs of future employers. An intra-generational equity, meaning that employer rate codes that incur injuries should be responsible for the costs associated with those injuries. A fair rate-making model encourages workplace safety and effective return to work policies by financially incentivizing employers' positive behaviors. Now if we look at the principle of collective liability, employers as a group and those within the same industry are jointly responsible for all workers' compensation costs Employers should not be excessively punished for unusually costly claims. Thus, portions of those kind of unusually costly claims should be shared by all employers. Then we look at the principles of rate stability or predictability along with transparency. In the realm of predictability, Employers should be able to rely on a level of predictability and stability in rates. From a reactivity perspective, industry should expect quicker recognition of successful prevention initiatives and claims management practices. Industries with poor safety performance should also be recognized quickly in the system. For transparency, our final principle, employers should be able to understand the factors that went into setting their premiums, and the WCB should be able to clearly communicate the information to employers. So when we look at our process, we want to consider what was critical to the process. And in that, we recognize that maintaining high levels of fairness and transparency overall in the rate setting process must factor in a few principles. Premiums collected in the future must, over the long term, be sufficient to cover expected costs and expenses. The model should be fair and equitable for all employers. The model must also be actuarially sound, meaning, as was mentioned earlier, 
that the plan is sufficiently funded to meet its projected liabilities and in a position to defray the reasonable expenses of its operations based on commonly accepted sound actuarial principles. Rate stability is important and we don't want to see massive increases result in the future. The system, though, must be sustainable. As already mentioned, it isn't clear how long the pandemic will continue or what the permanent effect it will have on employment or benefit experiences into 2021 and beyond. And we've made a decision that we don't want to pass that uncertainty on to employers at this point in time. So our next slide shows the key components of the rate model. And I've already spoken about some of these to a degree, but what this does is summarize the key components of the rate model and how they connect to the balancing principles. As you can see, most of the components impact more than one of the balancing principles. For example, both costly claim pooling and using an indicator to predict costs contribute to rate stability. This is offset by the impact that long-term claim costs have on rate reactivity. And I'm sure you can imagine that we can't pick and choose which component to use. The components work together within the rate setting model to determine our overall cost projection for the upcoming year. On our next slide, you can see the key drivers of the premium rate. The premiums that each employer pays, along with the investment income from those premiums, fund the workers' compensation system. There are two key components that factor into the calculation of premium rates. That is the payroll and the claims cost. So in the payroll, being the first component, it drives the premium rate based on all employers' payroll. And payroll is collected for all employers, for all workers, excuse me, in all industries subject to coverage under the Saskatchewan Workers' Compensation Act. From the perspective of claims costs, those costs associated with workplace injuries that have occurred in the past help us project what future claims costs will be. And so then our premium rates are set based on the ratio of claims costs to payroll. When we look at our overall payroll numbers, so those are our assessable payroll in the billions that are illustrated on the chart, we are still expecting an overall reduction of 3.94% for 2020 payroll, but we're expecting a return to 2019 levels in the year 2021. Accessible employer payroll for the 2021 premium year is expected to rise by 4% to $22.9 billion up from the 2020 estimate of $22 billion. Since 2014, the WCB has been moving the maximum assessable earnings towards 165% of the average annual wage. The move was gradual in order to ease employers into the increased premiums they would have to pay as a result. For 2019, the maximum assessable earnings rate was at 165% of the average annual wage. Beginning in 2020, the maximum assessable earnings are indexed with the change in average annual wage. This results in a 2021 average annual wage of $91,100. So the payroll projections are based on industry trends, 
industry input and payroll revisions. Last year at this time, we were projecting 2020 payroll to be $23.9 billion. However, as I just mentioned, we are now projecting this will be lower at $22.0 billion. The pandemic has had impacts for the entire economy, but there are more pronounced impacts for certain sectors. The rate codes in which payroll is anticipated to be most impacted by the pandemic are S22, which covers restaurants, catering, and dry cleaning, where we're seeing a minus 30.3%. In S23, which covers hotels, motels, and taxis, we're looking at a minus 28.9%. In T61, which is commercial air transportation, we are anticipating a minus 27.3%. And lastly, in D52, which is drilling, we're expecting a minus 20.77%. In each of these cases, it is expected that 2020 payroll will be down at least 20% from the previous year, as I just provided. In M33, which is refineries and upgraders, at minus 35.5%, this is another rate code that's experiencing payroll turbulence. However, this is mainly attributable to the labor dispute at the co-op refinery and with a tentative agreement now being in place, this volatility may settle. The sectors anticipated to be marginally impacted by the pandemic are utilities, which is U11, at a plus 2.1%, and U31 at a plus 5.3%. Healthcare, or G22, is expecting a positive 2.3%, and government at G51 is expecting a positive 4.9%. Lastly, agriculture, which is A11 and A21, it's a positive 2.3% and a positive 6.8%, respectively. And now I will pass the presentation over to Jennifer Norlene Bytel, our Vice President of Operations, and she will share some of the claims cost trends. Thank you, Crystal. Welcome, everyone. Overall, we're seeing an increase in cost within the rate model, and a primary driver of these cost increases is within the medical aid category. As Phil mentioned earlier, the longer an injured worker is off work, the more challenging it can be to get them back to work. And investing in healthcare earlier on is truly an investment in keeping the longer term claims costs down. Primary drivers of increases within the medical aid category include tertiary treatment programs, as well as costs related to psychological injuries. Tertiary treatment provides multiple services by an interdisciplinary team of healthcare providers experienced in the management of injuries with permanent impairments and or significant psychosocial and pain management issues. Tertiary treatment costs are up 3.3% in 2019 and 7.6% over a five-year period. Tertiary treatment represents 20.6% of all medical aid costs paid in 2019. We've also seen significant costs associated with psychological injury claims. We've experienced a 162% increase in accepted psychological injury claims from 2015 to 2019, from 135 to 354. The costs associated with psychological injuries have increased by 11.8% in 2019. However, the five-year cost increase is even more striking, up 30.9%, comparing 2014 to 2018 period 
the 2015 to 2019 period, which those five-year periods are used in the rate setting process. The five occupations with the most psychological injury claims include first responders, correctional services officers, registered nurses, community and social service workers, and transit operators. We anticipate that psychological injury claims will continue this upward pressure on the system, which is why part of our serious injury and fatality strategy includes a focus on the prevention of psychological injuries, which you'll hear more about a bit later in this morning. This next slide shows the overall cost increases from 2015 to 2019, and you can see an increasing trend here. I've already spoken to the medical aid costs, which are those blue bars on the bottom. The gray bars represent pension costs, which include earnings replacement, such as long-term wage loss costs, as well as survivor benefits. And those are re remain relatively stable from year to year. The small yellow bars are the costs associated with vocational rehabilitation, which include retraining or education costs when injured workers cannot return to their pre-injury job. And these represent a small portion of the overall claim cost. The orange bars here represent compensation costs, which are continuing to increase. When we look at these compensation cost increases, serious injuries continue to be a concern and a significant contributor to these increases. Approximately 12% of claims are considered serious injuries and account for 85% of compensation days and 83% of compensation costs. A combination of a consistent number of serious injuries per year, around 2,500, as well as increasing benefit levels due to increasing maximum wage, are both drivers of compensation cost increases. In recognition of the fact that a small percentage of claims are driving the costs within the system, we are looking at a two-pronged approach. The first is preventing serious injuries from occurring, which is the focus of the serious injuries and fatality strategy that Kevin is going to speak about in a little bit. The second, in the event that an injury does occur, we want to prevent work disability. When a person is unable to stay at work resume work, or return to work due to an illness or injury. In order to prevent work disability, we are looking to transform the way that we manage claims to enable better outcomes for the workers and employers of Saskatchewan. In pursuit of our claims transformation, we recognize that learning from our customers is critical. We've partnered with customers in two events so far this year. The first was a psychological visioning event in March. The purpose of this event was to identify gaps in the psychological claims management process so that we could better prioritize our improvement efforts. The event brought together over 30 participants representing injured workers, employers, and support organizations from within the first responder community over two days to hear customer stories, learn from others, and identify opportunities for improvement. More recently, in August, we held a claims transformation value stream mapping event that helped vision our future for managing claims. Employer, worker, and family representatives were involved in this event to keep us grounded, focused, and inspired. Some of what we heard from our customers include, customers want flexibility in how they're served and self-serve options are desirable. Relationships are key. Customers want to be more than just a number. Waiting is frustrating, and anticipating customer needs and proactively reaching out is valued. Telling their stories to multiple people is challenging, and customers don't see the value in that. The information coming out of our value stream mapping event was excellent, and we're currently developing a multi-year plan to ensure we implement the right changes at the right time. We are committed to talking and working with our customers about our future processes and look forward to more events in the coming months and years. 
With that, I'm going to turn it over to Kevin Mooney, our Vice President of Prevention and Employer Services, to run us through the preliminary rates and injury breakdown. Kevin? Thanks, Jennifer, and welcome, everyone. Um, so over the next couple of slides, I'll be talking about the 2021 preliminary rates and injury breakdown. Next slide, please. So the main objectives of the rate setting process are to ensure that the overall premium requirements of the WCB for the upcoming year are met. Premiums should cover all current and future costs for claims from employers operating during that year. And it includes worker compensation and vocational rehabilitation benefits, health care, survivor benefits, administration, and safety associations. The distribution of these revenue requirements across all employers is equitable, and while maintaining collective liability, it should promote accountability and fairness and recognize injury prevention and disability management. The rate setting process involves three steps to determine an employer's premium rate. The first one is industry classification. The second is establishing industry premium rates. And the third is the experience rating process, which considers an individual employer's claims experience. And I'll, I'll talk about uh, each of these here briefly. Next slide. Workers' compensation is a no-fault insurance system, and it's based on collective liability, where all employers share li liability for workplace injury insurance. The total cost of the compensation system is shared by all covered employers. The first step in the rate setting process is classification, and this is a process where similar employers are grouped together to form an industry rate code. Our classification system has 50 industry rate codes, and premium rates are set for each rate code based on the collective claims experience of employers within each of those industry rate codes. All employers within an industry rate code start off at the same industry premium rate. And the rate model strikes a balance, and Crystal talked about this earlier in the presentation. One is fairness, where industry rate codes are responsible for the injuries they incur and the costs associated with those industries. And the second part is collective liability, where employers are not unfairly burdened by unusually costly claims, and a portion of those costs are shared amongst a larger group of employers. Next slide, please. The WCB is funded 100% by premiums employers pay and the investment income earned from those premiums. Premiums that we collect in a year cover all costs of claims that happen in the year. So for example, if somebody was injured in a business at the age of 15, we would collect enough in 2021 to pay for the lifetime costs of that claim. An actuarial rate model is used to predict claims costs for the upcoming year. So setting and collecting premiums based on actuarial models promote financial stability of the system and security of the benefits for everyone. Costs include an industry's own claim costs as well as the portion of any shared costs. And that, again, that's the collective liability uh, component. So industry premium rates are really um, it's the costs divided by the payroll is how we arrive at the premium rate. Next slide, please. So in this slide, we'll discuss the breakdown of the 2021 required rate compared to the adjusted 2021 rate that Phil spoke about earlier in the presentation. So I'd like to draw your attention to the 2020 and 2021 required column, so both columns to the far right. As mentioned earlier, the six, the six cent increase from 2020 uh, to the required 2021 rate comes from increases in health care and administration. So a three cent increase for health care and three cent increase for administration. As represented by the bold figures, claim costs increased from 78 cents to 81 cents. And this was driven by health care portion. You know, Jennifer and Phil both talked about the, the cost of psychological claims. The admin cost rose from $0.28 cents to $0.31, cents, 
And the bulk of the increase here is related to a new collective uh, bargaining agreement, which drove up this ratio. To offset these increases and to invest in the strategic initiatives that target the 12% of serious injuries that account for greater than 80% of the compensation costs, Management also cut back on other administration expenses. The administration component is made up of, of a, a number of things. WCB admin expenses, Government of Canada fees, and WorkSafe Saskatchewan uh, funding that partnership. The remainder of the rate is comprised of legislative obligations. So we have the Occupational Health and Safety, Workers Advocates, and committee of review process, uh, which is, uh, will occur again here in 2021. We also have seven funded uh, safety associations representing 18 different rate codes. And this brings us to the average premium rate of $1.17 when holding the healthcare and admin components at last year's level. Next slide, please. In 2021, a capping mechanism to limit the increases and decreases in industry rates to no more than 10% is being implemented. This helps to limit the negative economic impact triggered from the COVID-19 pandemic. In addition to the board level hold, actuarial services recommends a capping mechanism to limit the increases and decreases in industry rates to no more than 10%. Capping is a practice that is used by other boards and in determining your rate, the rates were calculated by applying a cap and then rounding accordingly. Therefore, on your industry summary sheet, the plus or minus 10% will indicate that a cap has been applied, even though the actual rate change may not be a plus or minus 10%. This is also a way to smooth out experience over time and not see drastic increases. This allows us to see if the experience can be corrected over a longer period of time and the impacts will be shown on the next slide. The pie chart on the left shows the breakdown of the change from 2020 rate to the required 2021 rate. Under this scenario, the orange slice shows that 87% of employers from 41 of the 50 rate codes would have seen an increase to their industry rate compared to last year. The blue slice shows that approximately 12% of employers from seven rate codes would receive a decrease and 1% of employers from two rate codes would see no change. However, with the rate adjustments, the pie chart on the right shows the breakdown of the change from 2020 rates to the adjusted rate for 2021. Under this proposed scenario, you can see that the orange slice of the pie has shrunk as depicted by the, the orange slice, only 29% of employers in 20 rate codes will see a higher 2021 industry premium rate. The blue slice has grown significantly. 62% of employers from 26 rate codes will see a lower 2021 industry premium rate. And the gray slice has also grown to 8.7% of employers in rate codes seeing no change at all. Next slide, please. The third step in the rate setting process is the experience rating program. The experience rating program adjusts your premium rate based on your individual claims experience and provides an incentive to influence injury prevention. If your claims experience is better than your industry, you are likely in a discount position. If worse, a surcharge position. Therefore, reducing the number and cost of claims through injury prevention and workplace safety can improve your experience rating and reduce the WCB premiums that you pay. There are currently two programs in the experience rating program. The standard program is for smaller employers and the advanced program is for larger employers. I'll briefly uh, discuss each here. The standard program applies to employers with less than 21,000 in premiums over a three-year period and is based on the frequency of time loss injuries. There is a maximum discount of 25% and a maximum surcharge of 75%. And the standard program applies to approximately 88% of Saskatchewan employers. 
The advanced program applies to employers with premiums at least $21,000 over a, over a three-year period, so it applies to larger employers. It's a cost-based program, program where individual employers are compared to others in their industry. And if, if their performance is better, they will receive a discount, which is a maximum of 30%. Uh, if worse, they can receive a surcharge up to 200%. Next slide, please. This slide shows the estimated breakdown of employers' rate changes from 2020 compared to their 2021 premium rate after the experience rating program is applied. In the previous slides, we saw a similar pie chart showing the breakdown at the in industry level premium rates. In the adjusted rate breakdown, well over half of the employers in the province would see a discount. After experience rating is applied to each employer, the pie changes slightly. So the, the blue slice, approximately 50.7% of employers would receive a discount to the firm rate compared to the rate they paid in 2021. The orange slice, approximately 37% of employers would receive an increase to their 2021 rate. And the gray slice, approximately 12.3% of employers will see no change. Next slide, please. Over the next several slides, I'll talk about prevention and highlight what individual employers can do to influence their rate and speak to what the WCB is doing to influence the system on a broader scale. There are ways to influence and reduce your premium rates. Number one, by making sure you have an effective safety management system. And number two, by having a solid return to work program in the event that somebody is injured. The safety management system prevents injuries and a return to work program assists with injured workers' recovery. Prevention of injuries is the best way to control the premiums you pay to the WCB and WorkSafe Saskatchewan has a number of free online training programs available. In addition, the WCB Prevention Department has resources to help you with your safety needs. The services include training for Occupational Health Committee members and supervisors safety management system assessments, and information on how to develop the elements of your safety management system or return to work program. There are also seven funded safety associations that work directly with members of their industry rate codes to prevent workplace injuries, and they truly are the industry experts when it comes to safety in those rate codes. Next slide, please. Serious injuries here. So despite a consistent reduction in Saskatchewan's provincial total injury rate over the last 10 years, there are signs that reductions in workplace injuries are starting to plateau in the province. Research completed by other jurisdictions, including the Campbell Institute in the U.S., highlight that the opportunity to focus efforts on the reduction of serious injuries as a strategy to further reduce workplace injuries and address the plateau that we are experiencing. The Saskatchewan WCB definition for serious injury includes the following criteria. If a claim is a fatality, if a claim has more than 50 days of compensation paid, if a claim has a labor relations workplace safety referral flag, which means it was a serious incident where there could have been an amputation, a fracture, head injury, neck injury, serious eye injury. If a claim is a primary psychological mental health claim, and the fifth criteria is a claim that includes a permanent functional impairment equal to or greater than 10%. So if an if a injury meets one of those criteria, it's flagged as a serious injury. The graph on this slide indicates that the total number of serious injuries in Saskatchewan workplaces on an annual basis. And Jennifer already touched on this, but there are approximately about 2,400 to 2,500 serious injuries annually. And these numbers have remained relatively constant despite the reduction of time loss and no time loss claims during the same time frame. And again, serious injuries in 2019 accounted for approximately 12% of our total claims, however, make up 85% of compensation days, 83% of compensation costs, and almost 71% of medical costs. So as a result, there's, there's good reason to focus on these serious injuries. 
Next slide, please. This slide is another reminder as to why we are shifting our focus. Every year, fatalities continue to take place in Saskatchewan workplaces, having a profound impact on workers, employers, families, and communities. As of September 30th, 2020, we have had 27 fatalities in the workplace in Saskatchewan. Ten of these are related to asbestos exposure, five are due to firefighter cancer exposure, and four are related to motor vehicle crashes. Fatalities happen in many different industries. For example, fatalities happened in 37 of the 50 rate codes uh, from 2015 to 2019. And during that same time frame, 42% of fatalities were related to occupational disease and 58% were related to acute traumatic injuries. Next slide, please. At the end of 2019, WorkSafe Saskatchewan, a partnership between the WCB and the Ministry of Labor Relations and Workplace Safety, released the Fatalities and Serious Injury Strategy. WorkSafe continues to work on the implementation of the initiatives outlined in the strategy. As it relates to fatalities, the main areas of focus include asbestos exposure, motor vehicle crashes, firefighter cancers, and falls from heights. As it relates to motor vehicle crashes in 2020, uh, we're trending at a 33% reduction when comparing uh, statistics from January to September uh, from 2020 against 2019. Also, falls from heights are also trending below last year, trending at a 14.5% reduction during the same time frame. The main areas of focus related to serious injuries include healthcare, transportation, first responders, construction, and manufacturing. Progress related to this strategy is updated every six months, and the most current report outlining what has been achieved to the end of June 2020 is posted on the WorkSafe website at www.worksafesask.ca. Next slide, please. As stated in the previous slides, we have a consistent number of serious injuries and fatalities in Saskatchewan workplaces. As a result, the WCB has a strategic initiative, which is a three to five year strategy to reduce serious injuries and fatalities in the province. And over the next five years, the WCB Prevention Department will collaborate and work more side by side with our customers to reduce serious injuries and fatalities. So we're really wanting to get outside of the classroom uh, where we spend most of our time right now uh, teaching and, and getting into more of a consulting role and working side by side with our customers. In addition, customer involvement in planning and implementing sustainable safety solutions to mitigate serious injuries and fatalities will be well established. So in 2021, we're, we're looking to implement a stakeholder engagement strategy to, to further engage uh, stakeholders uh, from the employer community, industry, labor, to continue to develop and refine this strategy. In 2021, we will continue to implement fatalities and serious injury strategy. We do have objectives that are outlined uh, to the end of 2021, and we'll look to further engage stakeholders in the process. Work has also begun on a collaborative consulting approach to work directly with employers to identify and address root causes of serious injuries. And we're currently piloting that with the healthcare industry. As we work with employers on root cause investigations, there's an opportunity to further develop external partnerships. So as we learn more about the root causes of those 2,500 serious injuries, it will help inform um, strategic partnerships that we need to form to help address those root causes. One of those new partnerships is a partnership with Dr. Jody Samra, a registered psychologist. And uh, this will address the growing prevalence and of psychological injuries that Jennifer spoke to earlier. In 2021, we will also continue development and implementation of a psychological health and safety resource center. The resource center will have practical resources available to workers and employers to help educate and create a psychologically healthy and safe work environment. The first set of resources being developed will focus on the 13 psychosocial factors 
as outlined in the CSA standards, as well as the five domains of psychologically safe leadership. And those of you that are attending the Psych Health and Safety virtual event on November 26, 2020, will get a sneak peek at this resource center. Very excited about it. We will also look to engage with the employer groups through a community of practice. So we'll, we'll form safety groups and, and help employers uh, develop and implement a psychologically safe workplace. And we'll continue our work with the First Responder Mental Health Committee. I will now hand the reins back over to Phil to walk us through the long-term outlook. Thanks, Kevin. When we think of the long-term outlook, I'd like to reiterate some of my previous messages. First, the prior trend in positive claims experience is flattening, and for some rate codes and employers, it's reversing. This injury rate, uh, this injury rate experience is no longer able to offset the increases in compensation and healthcare costs. So some rate codes and employers can expect rate increases in the near future, and possibly as soon as 2022. Second, projecting payroll and costs for 2021 was challenging. The forecasting process developed for post-pandemic projections are based on pre-pandemic experience. Third, economic and investment market uncertainty, the consistent number of serious injuries and fatalities, and increasing healthcare costs are putting upward pressure on premium rates. And fourth, the board is financially sound to absorb the cost increases for 2021, but cannot continue this practice in future years. Given the changing economic environment, WCB's external actuary, Eon, has recommended a financial sustainability study. The, sustain, the scope of this actual sustainable, sustainability study will be comprehensive and will commence towards the beginning of 2021. The sustainability study helps the board understand the framework needed to steer the ship in the right direction over the long term. It may also help with rate stability, but it does not directly help with reducing claims costs or premiums required to cover, the, cover those claims costs. The study should help us meet our long-term outcomes and ensure policies are in place to maintain or improve fairness in the system. As it relates to our strategic plan, assuming that nothing was to change, we will see increases in premium rates. However, there is a strategic plan that is meant to minimize the impact by reducing serious injuries and fatalities and improving recovery and return to work outcomes. I wanna pause for a second and, and, and thank all those customers and, and, and stakeholders as been illustrated by or talked about by, by Kevin and Jennifer. We want to engage our customers in helping us improve our processes. And I wanna thank Labor Relations and Workplace Safety, employer associations, labor representatives, first responders, the workers, employers, researchers, uh, safety associations that all have supported us in developing the fatality and serious injury strategy, the rapid improvement event related to psychological claims, and the value stream mapping event related to claims. All of those external, that input from external parties was extremely invaluable, invaluable to us and we will continue to engage stakeholders in figuring out how we can better serve our customers and create better outcomes. So this five, three to five year plan should help us stabilize or maybe even reduce that pressure to increase costs. Assuming our plan is successful, we could see pressure on premium rates reverse. This plan will require ongoing partnerships and supports from employers, workers, employer associations, labor organizations, safety associations. In particular, we need our customers and stakeholders to support the necessary investments to improve the systems that will lead to better customer service and improved outcomes. 
And just a reminder, based on what we saw in the rate model for 2021, for, uh, in 2024, the 2021 premium rates, it, may, it will not be a surprise if we see increases in 2022. So what's next? As you know, October is traditionally a time for us to provide information on premium rates, share this with employers and stakeholders. Any rate codes that have increases over 10.5% will be published in the Saskatchewan Gazette. Affected employers will receive a letter advising them of an increase over 10.5%. Our practice is traditionally, and we'll continue to provide employers with 30 days to provide feedback regarding premium rates, and we welcome your feedback within this time frame. Please email ask, w, ask at wcbsas.com with any feedback you have. In November, we'll collect all the feedback, provide that to the board, and the board considers the feedback in ultimately determining the final rates. Then in December, employers will receive their rate letters with their premium rate for 2021. Ensure your business has a WCB online account for early access to your premium rate notice. We are anticipating having uh, premium rate letters out as maybe as early as December 3rd. In addition, there are industry rate sheets that will be available at the end of this presentation on our website. This information includes some rate code statistics as well as premium rate information. As well, there will be a portion of the explanation that shows for your specific rate code uh, the, the reduced amount based on the approach we set, we, we took this year in establishing premium rates. So a link to this information will be sent out shortly through our chat feature. And WCB resources, are, of course, are always available if you have questions. If you'd like more industry information or a discussion about what's happening in your industry, our account managers from the prevention department are always available to arrange a time to discuss this with you. And then a reminder that the information presented today will be on our website at www.wcbsask.com and on our YouTube channel. Just search for Saskatchewan Workers' Compensation Board and you should see a link to our YouTube channel. Again, I'd like to thank you for your participation today, and I'd like to turn it back to Gord. Thank you, Phil, and thank you to all the VPs that presented. So this brings our formal presentation to a close. Uh, we will now open the chat for your questions. This is your time uh, for those of you in attendance to uh, ask questions. So we'll alternate between questions from the chat. But once again, please ask your first question, then leave an opportunity for the next person to ask their question. So with that, uh, Carolyn, please get us started. Um, the first, uh, first question that we have is, why was a 10% cap selected? Okay, uh, Gord, did you want me to take, I can take that if you'd like, Gord. You go ahead, yes. Yeah, and VPs, please uh, feel free to jump in here at any point in time. But a 10% cap was, was uh, implemented for a couple of different reasons. We have seen in the past uh, some pretty significant increases and decreases in particular rate codes. And Aon had advised us that other jurisdictions use a cap to smooth out increases or decreases over time. So that, that's one factor and something that we will be looking at, not just on a one-year basis, but um, so that 10% cap is, is a temporary um, change. We will look at something like that maybe going forward uh, as a consideration um, based on Aon's recommendation. But then secondarily, uh, without the cap, even at $1.17, without a cap, we could have seen some rate codes go up uh, quite a bit. 
And some of the rate codes that are hit hardest by payroll reductions could have been hit hardest by premium rate increases. And because the pandemic was a shutdown of some industries, we felt it was important to mitigate any increase going to any particular rate codes. Hopefully that answers your question. VPs, do you have anything else to add? I think you covered it off, Phil. It's just, you know, under the 10% cap, it was more reflective of the true experience. Uh, and so I think you covered it off there. Um, we have another question in, um, and it's uh, how much will WCB cover for a wage loss, considering that the funding will reduce? I, I can take that one as well. The, the, the coverage for wage loss is not changing. In fact, it's going up from 88,000, whatever that cap was, to 91,100. So wage loss, the way we make wage loss payments to injured workers and the way we cap wages for employers will still be dealt with in the same way. Okay, and there's a question here from Sandra Cripps. Um, I am interested to know when the last sustainability study was completed and if the impact from COVID is an influencer. Um, I'll, I'll start and then maybe um, Crystal can, can jump in here. Um, I think anytime you have a major shift, uh, that you don't anticipate. I think you need to step back as an organization like WCB because we have the fund. The fund is invested in a way to get us reduce any losses to that fund and get a certain return so that we can pay for the, the, the future costs of claims. So when somebody's injured or the premiums that employers pay us in a given year aren't spent in that year, a portion of that premiums is set aside and invested because claims don't start and end within a calendar year. Somebody might be injured today and they might need medical aid or compensation revoked rehabilitation, you know, for the next eight months. They might need it for the next 50 years. We don't know. So the actuarial model says here's how much money you probably need to set aside. If you invest that and get a certain rate of return, you should be able to cover off all of the costs associated with claims within that year. Um, what the, the rate sustainability model looks at is a number of different factors. Uh, certainly COVID is an impact, but it's not the only one. We also have IFRS, new standard coming in. So there's a number of factors where, and it's just good practice every few years to look at what you're, how you're investing and managing the fund overall and making sure that your assets line up with your liabilities. Crystal, do you have uh, more detail or, or a different way of explaining that? I think you did a great job, Phil. The only thing I would add is we're anticipating that the sustainability study would have just a little bit broader mandate um, than the historic asset liability studies that have been conducted. And um, we just think it's a good time to move to that model based on advice from our external actuary. And so I think um, what, uh what Sandra was looking for is also when, uh, what was the date when the last one was uh, was done, the last sustainability study? Yes, and I'm just looking for that. Oh, go ahead. The asset liability study, which as Crystal's pointed out, is not 100% the same, but very close to a sustainability study. That was done in 14, 15, 16, with changes implemented, I think, in 17. Okay. All right, I'll take another um, of the uh, pre-submitted questions here. Um, will the WCB consider a hold in 2022 if things do not get better? Will there be gradual increases to the board level rate over time or will uh, things revert to normal in 2022? 
Okay. Uh, thanks for that question. Um, as, I, as we indicated kind of throughout the presentation, we're going to monitor the situation. At the end of the day, if things track the way they are, right now we're not anticipating um, holding the premium in 2022 or um, uh, easing into 2022, like easing increases into rate codes. But um, we're going to monitor all the factors involved from investments to payroll to claims costs and uh, you know we we may have a different decision to make at this time next year but for now we're not anticipating holding the 2022 premium rate or gradually increasing premium rates over time bill i would just add to that that we do have a collaborative group uh, of finance folks and employer services uh, a cash flow committee that meets on a regular basis um, and uh, we're reviewing a number of economic factors um, ongoing and one of those factors includes uh, the revision of payrolls um, so as Phil talked about earlier in the presentation that uh, payroll revisions were revising in the negative for a number of months there from um, March to you know the end of September um, October is looking good. We're starting to see positive uh, payroll revisions coming in now too. So it's kind of an early sign that uh, employer confidence is starting to uh, improve. Uh, but we'll continue to monitor the economy and, and make decisions accordingly. Okay. Um, we have another question here from Jennifer. Um, her question is, will there be a tutorial or a webinar available to users to explain the 2021 moving to the paperless method? to help navigate using it? Jennifer, that is a good question that I do not know the answer to. Um, maybe um, employer services, do you know if there's a tutorial um, or a fact sheet or instructions that are available? All I have right now, Phil, is that I know that we're posting right after the presentation, like you mentioned, is, is the uh, individual industry rate statement. Um, I know this is our first year going to paperless due to COVID and other other reasons. I think it's a good suggestion. I think it's something that we should consider um, and, and put a, a short explainer video or something on, on the website to explain it. Okay, and uh, Barb has a question here. I'm curious about other jurisdictions and whether there are trends elsewhere showing a plateau of injury stats or whether trends point upward or downward in other locales. So um, when, when I speak to other jurisdictions across Canada and uh, North America, most jurisdictions are seeing a a flattening of injury rates, and in particular, uh, an ongoing, what I'll say, stubbornly high fatality rate um, is something that we have discussed. Now, it's not that's not specific to every jurisdiction, um, but for the most part, we are seeing a flattening of injury rates across North America, and little to no improvement on the reduction of fatalities. I just to add to that, Phil, I'm, I'm hearing the same conversation when I talk to my counterparts across the country and in other jurisdictions where uh, we have seen consistent reductions in time loss injury rates and total injury rates over the last decade. Uh, but to Phil's point, uh, we have not had the same level of performance uh, as it relates to workplace fatalities and serious injuries. So there's a lot of emerging research coming out around, you know, changing a focus and, and, and focusing more on the reduction of serious injuries um, and, and what some of the early research is showing that um, uh, employers that do that, uh, the workforce becomes more to understanding in the workplace and that has a compounding effect which not only further reduces serious injuries and fatalities but starts to reduce um, other types of too, kind of breaks through that plateau. OK, 
Okay, um, we have another pre-submitted question. Um, and I'm just going to, we're getting some feedback here, so um, I'm just going to see if I can mute. And then I'll unmute. Um, what is the WCB doing to help employers get injured workers back to work as soon as it's medically safe? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, thank you for that question. Jen, do you want to take this question? Sure, I certainly can. I think I was on mute there for a second. Um, you know, I think there's two pieces to this. Um, I spoke a little bit to our claims transformation. Um, so there's a little bit of the longer term. In the short term, we're really focused on, you know, getting enough information from the care providers on restrictions as we can to be able to partner with employers and workers on that. Um, also, you know, 2020 is an anomaly year. You know, there were a number of impacts because of COVID um, that impacted our abilities. So when, um, when we had a bit of a shutdown and we couldn't access treatment, um, we're still kind of working through those backlogs to get, there's not many left that are there, but, you know, we have to make sure that we can get the workers into the, you know, appointments that they need to be able to be seen in order for us to be able to move forward with some of that. So there's kind of two pieces to the story. 2020 is a little bit of um, a challenging year because of COVID, but um, if we kind of set that off to the side, as we look towards um, our claims transformation, our intent is that we're getting to the claims as quickly as we possibly can, that we're engaging all the partners in conversations and collaborative um, dialogue so that we can establish what workers um, might be able to still do at the workplace and get them there as quickly as we can. And, you know, key to our future is that relationship piece and making sure that we're building trusting relationships with all parties involved in the process as we move forward. Okay, I've got another pre-submitted question. Um, and then, uh, Sandra, we'll go back to your question. I think two came in just right at the same time. Um, so the pre-submitted question says, does the, does the WCB have plans to increase the discounts and surcharges in the experience rating program? Um, at this time, we have no plans. We do have a periodic pro we have a process that we periodically go through that reviews the experience rating program. Um, we have, as Kevin pointed out, it's likely we're going to have a committee of review starting sometime in the near future, maybe 2021. And so our, our thought is um, it's possible that that could get discussed through the next committee of review. If, if not, um, then we may strike a subcommittee to start look at the experience rating program. Um, so there, ha there hasn't been any major changes, I think, since 2017 uh, when we, uh, through customer feedback, we made sure that um, claims where there was only medical appointments, those that time loss or, or that time spent attending medical appointments wouldn't be considered time loss for the purposes of experience rating and rate setting, which, uh, or especially if you're a small employer, um, had a positive impact on, on many employers' uh, experience overall. So th those were the last changes, and we have no current changes in the hopper, but we, we will be looking at that over the next few years, either through the committee of review or potentially a separate committee. Okay. Um, we've got another question here from Therese. Um, what cost relief is going to be applied to those claims where workers cannot return to work as they are waiting for surgery, which was canceled? So we, 
we have a couple of different documents on the website and um, the, the board had made a decision to assist workers and employers through COVID. One was that um, any COVID related claim and associated costs would come off an employer's experience assuming the employers were at least reasonably attempting to meet uh, all the protocols. If an employer was um, completely ignoring protocols, then we do have a mechanism to put those claims and claims costs back on to an employer's file. We haven't had to do that yet, but uh, that, that still may happen. Um, secondarily, um, the other decision was is as it relates to cost relief, so to speak, for COVID-related claims, we also the board also looked at and agreed that any claims that were extended because of COVID, meaning they couldn't access health care services and or could not access a, a workplace for return to work because the workplace was shut down or there were job losses, those types of things, those costs would not directly impact the employer. Those costs would be eligible for cost relief for the period by which um, uh, COVID is impacting that claim. Um, Jennifer, anything else to add or Kevin? I would just add, Phil, that it won't affect an employer's uh, safety rating either as it relates to the COVID-related claims. So the ones that we're giving 100% uh, cost relief for, uh, those won't show up on the employer's uh, statement. So I know that was another common concern from the employer community when they're bidding for work and whatnot, uh, that these claims might adversely affect their, their ratings, but uh, they won't. Um, and then, I, yeah, I think you've covered everything off but the partial cost relief for uh, current claims that are extended due to COVID reasons and the, the slowdown in the healthcare community. Um, nothing else to add. And Jennifer here, the, the other piece that I would just add is that there's currently around 700 claims that have been identified as being impacted. So it kind of gives you a little bit of an idea as to the quantity that we're looking at related to this. Okay, uh, we have another uh, question here from Sandra and um, Gord, this one is for you. Um, if you could give uh, just an update on the appeals for this year. Uh, thanks, Carolyn and, and Sandra, thanks for that question. Uh, I have some uh, approximate figures uh, for you, but uh, I certainly could give you some more uh, exact figures uh, after the meeting by way of an email. But uh, the, uh, the Board Appeal Tribunal um, has uh, been very active uh, by teleconference with uh, hearings since approximately March 16th. Uh, every, every hearing since then, uh, for those appellants that want it, have uh, had a teleconference hearing. Others simply want uh, what we call a non-hearing or a paper review. And uh, the tribunal, quite frankly, is doing very well in, uh, in lowering uh, the waiting times uh, for appellants. And, uh, and the, uh, I believe the September statistic uh, for uh, uh, turnaround time for appellants was around 120 days, which is uh, certainly within our acceptable level, that's for sure. Uh, but again, Sandra, I can give you, I uh, get you more specific information uh, by way of an email uh, stating the number of hearings that we've had uh, uh, since uh, March 16th and uh, or thereabouts, and certainly from the beginning of the year. Uh, but uh, COVID-19 uh, has certainly uh, eliminated in-person hearings uh, uh, since the middle of March and will continue to do so uh, uh, until uh, we feel it's uh, safe to have in-person hearings. So again, thanks for that question, Sandra. Okay, um, we have another question here from Steve. Um, if an employee feels they contracted COVID during their working shift, should they make a WCB claim? Uh, yes, yes they should. And then there is a process by which we confirm a 
the individual has COVID, and then B, contact tracing to confirm whether or not it was in fact um, contracted through the workplace. Right now, um, I, I don't know the the numbers, but I, I think uh, the majority of what I'll say is denied COVID claims, I think about almost 100%, it's not quite, but almost 100% don't, don't, don't have COVID. So the first step is getting them tested. Um, so they should submit, we get tested, confirm whether or not they've got COVID. If they got COVID, we have a contact tracing process in order to confirm whether or not it was work related. Okay, and um, I have another um, pre-submitted question. Um, as an employer, we don't always know where to focus our prevention efforts. Does the WCB have information on the causes of serious workplace injury injuries in the province? Kevin, do you? Sorry, Phil. Um, yeah, definitely. We, we've got lots of resources. Uh, WorkSafe Saskatchewan is a good place to, to start, and that's the partnership between uh, the WCB and the Ministry of Labor Relations and Workplace Safety. Uh, as mentioned earlier, we do have a three-year strategy that outlines key targets and actions uh, related to serious injuries and fatalities. Uh, and we worked with uh, industry, employer groups, and labor, and, and, and others to, to develop those objectives. Um, the serious injury part of the strategy focuses on a couple of different industries right now, uh, healthcare, transportation, uh, pu public safety, uh, personnel, construction and manufacturing, uh, which has some of the highest uh, work-related serious injuries. And uh, it also prioritizes other areas. We're focused on uh, hand injuries, hand serious injuries in manufacturing, that sort of thing. Uh, you can learn more about the strategy on WorkSafe Saskatchewan. Um, so we do have that posted on the website. And um, we're looking to engage with stakeholders uh, in the new year here to, to focus on other areas uh, collectively. Um, again, as mentioned in my presentation as well, we do offer services, uh, training services to train Occupational Health and Safety Committee members, uh, supervisors, um, we have a number of free online training courses on WorkSafe Saskatchewan uh, related to inspections, investigations, mental health, uh, et cetera. Uh, we've formed partnerships uh, with the University of Fredericton to offer uh, highly subsidized training related to psychological health and safety. Uh, we do uh, WorkSafe uh, safety management system assessments so we can come out and do a gap assessment on your your safety management system and provide guidance and, and assistance with, uh, you know, addressing the gaps that you might have. Uh, we do have return to work resources. I would say that that's probably a resource that's maybe underutilized uh, by employers. So there's there's further opportunity there where we can do a bit of a gap assessment and, and provide uh, assistance with some of the fundamentals there on, on how an employer can, you know, safely return a person back to work and develop modified duties. And, and good reporting and all that good stuff. Um, so I'd encourage you to go to the website. That's a good place to start. Otherwise, you can reach out to our prevention department uh, for more details. Um, and we also have our employer resource center, which is the 1-800 number on our website, which can uh, field a number of prevention-related questions you might have. Thank, thanks, Kevin. Kevin, can we post the, um, the, num the phone numbers that employers can call if they believe they've had what we would consider a serious injury, just to talk to a prevention consultant or account manager about um, looking at root causes or things like that? Yeah, I think we could, we're getting close to that. Like we're, we're just finishing up our pilot with healthcare um, and refining our process. And so that's going to be a, it's a coaching process to help employers um, through 5Y, you know, get to root causes of serious injuries. And then we, we offer uh, systematic kind of uh, hazard control recommendations. So yeah, I think we should post that information on there um, because as we've alluded to throughout this whole presentation is collectively uh, as an employer community, if, if we can all focus on those 2,500 serious injuries and really get focused on identifying those root causes, 
and developing strategic partnerships to address those those root causes. Uh, not only are we going to reduce the harm that that um, is realized by those the workers that have a serious injury, but we saw the business side too, right? Eighty-five uh, percent of our costs. So the entire health of the system kind of depends on it as well. So Phil, yeah, let's uh, we'll put that information on there. Thanks, Kevin. So there's a, a follow-up question from Naomi about um, the uh, COVID testing. Um, and so no, Naomi has written, so an employee should start a WCB claim prior to their COVID test if they believe they have contracted COVID at the workplace. And then rather than uh, starting it after the positive test result has been confirmed. That's a question. Yeah, no, you can submit your claim information at any time. You can go for your COVID test. You don't have to wait for our permission for a COVID test. But Jen, any other recommendations? I would say if you suspect you have COVID for any reason, well, go get tested. Um, you could submit at any point in time you think it's maybe work-related. You can submit a, a W-1 or pick up the phone. Uh, there are phone numbers that you can call and, and talk to our claims area to get more specific direction or instructions. But I wouldn't wait. Um, for any type of testing and or wait to submit. Um, there's no harm in submitting to us and then if we confirm you don't have COVID or confirm it's not work related, nobody's out of anything, but um, uh, the quicker we get on these things, the quicker we can help resolve them. Yeah, the only thing I'd add, like I think you made a good point is if you think you've been exposed, you know, the first step is to go and get that test, right? In order for it for us to be even considering whether something's work related, there needs to be that confirmed diagnosis, right? At the end of the day. So um, going for that step and then whether you're initial you're submitting that uh, claim immediately thereafter, that's just fine. You know, we're happy we're here, we're happy to help. Okay, um, I'll go to one of the pre-submitted questions and then we have another question coming in from uh, Rakshana. Um, how is the maximum assessable wage deter rate determined? Yeah, sure. I was going to say, Kev, do you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. So the maximum assessable wage rate is determined by a number of uh, economic indicators, uh, such, such as the inflation rate um, and the consumer price index. Um, so the maximum amount, amount per employee may change from year to year. And Phil talked about that, how in 2020, it was 88,906, I believe. And for 2021, it's going to be at right around, I think, 91,000. And so, and that's related to provincial legislation requires us to set a maximum accessible wage rate annually. Okay. And another pre-submitted question, it says, uh, do we pay premiums on the full salary of each of our employees? You do up to the maximum. So if the maximum is 91,100, if all your workers are, let's say, getting paid under 90, the whatever the 2021 number is, 91,100, I think it is, um, will be, if all your workers are under that amount, you, you would submit full, full wages, those full wage numbers. But if you have a number of workers making over that cap, that 91,100, you only pay premiums on the first 91,100. Okay. Yeah, and I would just maybe add to that, Phil, that, you know, that's a common, kind of a common error that we see when people are reporting payroll is, is folks reporting more than the max accessible. And I think sometimes even, like, as we dig into some of those root causes, even some of the payroll systems that the organizations are using, sometimes the, uh, some of the controls are maybe set for uh, BC, WCB, or a different province, you know. Um, so, Really look forward to if, if uh, folks on the phone have ideas on how we could better educate uh, and provide uh, awareness around this. I think it, there could be a win-win here. Okay, um, we have a question from Rakshana. Um, 
employees who have precondition or are vulnerable, would WCB cover them even though as an employer we have all security measures put in place? Uh, I can take that one. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Jim. Yeah. So really what we're looking for when we have a claim submitted is whether the injury arose out of and in the course of employment. And we actually have a policy around pre-existing conditions there. Um, we, we're not necessarily determining whether the pre-existing, sorry, <laughs> the worker's pre-existing condition isn't necessarily considered in the initial determination to accept the claim, but, but it will determine ongoing responsibility. So um, it is, you know, we need to take the appropriate measures for all individuals in our workplace to ensure that we're providing um, the appropriate uh, safety precautions, uh, recognizing that there may be some that are more susceptible to things than others, and we might need to adapt accordingly. Um, but we do certainly have um, this particular policy related to pre-existing conditions, which speaks to um, aggravating the pre-existing condition or accelerating it. And I can certainly follow up, Rakshana, to provide you with a little bit more information on that um, following the event as well. Okay, we have another question here from Lori, and Lori said, if coworkers practice social distancing at work and are effectively protecting each other from COVID, but they also live together, if they have co contracted COVID from each other, would this be accepted as a WCB injury as they got it from their coworker slash housemate? You know, well, that's a really good question. <laughs> yeah. You know, as we have to sift through the scenarios that are presented, right? And what we're really trying to understand is if there was potential exposure within the workplace. Um, you know, if there was exposure within the workplace as the starting point, then that might indicate, you know, that both end up with it from a certain way. But we there's certain... Um, in investigation that will be undertaken when we're reviewing these claims to help us understand if it's more likely than not that it took place that the exposure occurred in the workplace versus you know outside um, in the personal space so that one in particular we'd have to you know we'd have to work through the details around that just to understand what are the patterns for the individuals, you know, if they're only ever leaving their house to go to the workplace, that's one thing, versus if they're out in the public a little more frequently. So it will depend on the specific circumstances, but that one would be one that would be, um, we'd need to be asking some different questions given that particular circumstance for sure. And in the yeah. event that it's, I was just gonna say, in the event that it's um, hard to tell if it's more likely and we would give benefit of the doubt to the workplace exposure um, being there. But again, I don't want to just say that, yes, that's what it would be. We would have to look at the specific circumstances. Yeah. I was just going to add, and this is, I don't think is the exact question you're asking, but just as an example, we have had situations where two workers have been found to have had COVID in the work environment that, that hang out quite a bit together, but the contact tracing showed the first individual actually caught it at a barbecue or, or a lounge or a party and brought it into the workplace and gave it to the second one. So the first person, it's not a work-related COVID case. The second one, because they caught, contracted it in the work environment while working, is a work-related COVID case. So as Jennifer pointed out, you know, one of those two individuals that cohabitate together, one of them would have gotten it from somewhere. We'd fix, start from that point and figure out where did that happen? How did that happen? Was it in the workplace? Was it not? And, and go from there. Okay, we have another question here. Um, it's my first year with WCB as a small business. And last year, the previous owner had an estimated payroll, and I increased that estimated payroll for this year. If the payroll is less than the estimated, would we get a refund? 
I'm not sure how WCV works. So, yes, you would. Anytime you know that your estimate is inaccurate, especially as you get closer to the end of the year, contact employer services and, and let them know what your new estimate is or potentially what your actual is likely to be. Um, and we can adjust that accordingly. If you've paid us too much, then we, we will return premiums if, it, if we can confirm that at the end of the day, your, your estimate was too high. Okay, and another question here from Jessica. Um, what is the max accessible earnings forecast? With COVID and the effects of the, the economy, some industries have experienced wage reductions. Uh, would that be considered for future max earning calculations? Yeah. So if we have a situation where COVID caused, um, there was enough layoff that COVID caused the average weekly wage to not increase. We, we, we obviously wouldn't increase the average weekly wage. Um, this year, you know, surprisingly through, throughout COVID, uh, approximately 80, and I heard last night 87%, so somewhere in that range of workers continued to work through COVID. So, um, and a lot of those were higher wage earners that, that continued to work. So, um, but um, we, if there's no increase, then we don't in automatically increase the um, maximum assessable wage rate. Um, but in this case, using uh, the, the figures that we got from That's Canada in, in March, we were able to show that there had been an increase from 2019 to 2020 of about 2.5%. Okay, and um, the final submitted question, uh, will any part of the 13.4 million be charged to industry in the future, or is it a full subsidization with no strings attached? Yeah, we're not anticipating um, recovering that 13.4 million, we're, we're proposing to take it out of the fund. Now, obviously that decreases our funded ratio, it gets us closer to um, the minimum amount that we need legally by legislation to be funded. But assuming we don't go below 105% funding, um, we have at this point no reason to um, try and um, retrieve or get that money back. Right now, that $13.4 million we're anticipating is just an offset of costs to employers, and we're not expecting to recover that money back. Okay, and that's, um, that's the end of the questions that we have uh, both submitted um, online and the pre-submitted questions. Hey, Carolyn, uh, if I could, just a, a point of clarification related to the question earlier about the tutorial online. Um, we will have the individual employer rate statements available online December 7th. Um, so I just wanted to add that as well. Okay. And I think, I think it requires um, a secure online account in order to access um, that, that area? Correct. Right. Okay, if there's no other good, questions, uh, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, Carolyn, yeah. If there are no other questions, I'll just uh, wrap up uh, uh, today's session. Uh, first of all, I uh, want to thank uh, that one question uh, that I believe it was Sandra that submitted uh, to, the, uh, to the tribunal. Uh, for those of you that are not aware, um, tribunal work uh, encompasses uh, over two-thirds of what this board uh, actually does. One-third is governance and uh, two-thirds is tribunal work. 
and we seldom get questions on our tribunal work. So I do appreciate that one question that we received. And as I mentioned, uh, Sandra, we'll get you, get you further information on what we've been doing for sure. So with that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, all 300 approximately of you that joined us today, uh, we certainly hope that you found the session worthwhile and informative. And again, we thank you for taking the time to uh, join us today and for your attention to this important uh, meeting and information. Uh, thank you also for all of your continued efforts to help keep Saskatchewan uh, achieving zero workplace injuries and to help keep everyone safe on the job and at home. Uh, speaking of injury prevention, we encourage you to join us on December 3rd in Regina for WorkSafe Saskatchewan's second annual one-day psychological health and safety learning event. Speakers include mental health experts from the national stage and Saskatchewan employers sharing their lessons learned following the launch of successful workplace mental health initiatives. Registration opens uh, on October 30th. And you can find more information at www.worksafesas.ca. So again, uh, the board and the executive, thank you for joining us today. And in this day and age of COVID-19, we wish you a safe and healthy day and a safe trip home wherever you might be going. So with that, again, we sincerely thank you.